it's it's amazing that when you ask anybody to define what the church is, uh, we define it as the assembly of the called out ones. And when we say called out ones, say people who have received Christ Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, who have been, well, regenerated. We use all the arrows. Renewed, regenerated, and, and everything. But yet still, when you come into the church, one of the things you realize is that uh, the called out ones really doesn't seem to be the called out ones. And I'm talking about the church globally. I'm not making reference to any particular local church, but the church globally. You, 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 it almost looks like um, the the society that has just been transported into a building and or probably uh, that and that has just been it's like um you take one portion of the society and you just put them somewhere and then we call the church meanwhile it's supposed to be uh the uh, assembly of, of of the called out one those that have been renewed regenerated filled with the holy spirit and um christ has come in and the heart of Stone is taken away and heart of flesh has come in. But it seems to be far from uh, sometimes the characteristics, what you see and what you hear, seems to be nothing like heart of flesh has really come and been to the heart. Uh, it looks like the heart of stone has just been washed uh, um, and uh, put back. So when it's, there, there is a sense of freshness, but the same people um, and I think um, one of the reasons that could be because um, this mind of Christ which is supposed to be to be to be to be manifested is not really being manifested and um, we started looking at Philippians chapter chapter 2 we started looking at Philippians chapter 2 and um, we we came down to verse 11 um, we spoke quite extensively on on this where Paul was challenging the believers in Philippine uh, uh, in Philippi sorry that if there be any consolation if there be any encouragement if there be any comfort of love any fellowship of fellowship of the spirit any bowels of mercies and we're saying Paul was not questioning whether there is whether these are in Christ it, that was far from the point because we know they are in in Christ and was challenging them it is just like saying when he says if you if you have known Christ when he knows they know Christ so you 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 might call it a way of speaking, I mean, uh, Paul's way of, of, of making certain points, that indeed we are in Christ, we, we have received the comfort of his love, we have the fellowship of the Spirit, of course, there are bowels of mercy, so I mean, actually, we have, we have experienced them, and um, he challenges them to have this mind of Christ, the mind which was in Christ, which made him, although God became man. And um, it is it is interesting. I, I was uh, thinking through the whole thing. You realize that the when we talk about the gospel, we begin by saying God became man. And if that is a starting point of the gospel, then obviously that that should be a starting point of the Christian life. <laughs> God became man. That is, he stepped down, he humbled himself, became man. So the beginning of the Christian life is the same thing. That, that whoever is in Christ also begins with humility. It starts from there. Because we got um, every man who receives Christ Jesus descends from his ivory tower and begins to live among the Live, li live on the same level as the as the as the as the as the brethren. Um, 
So basically what I'm saying is that if God became man, that's Christ came from his heavenly throne, became man, and it is only reasonable that we, that a Christian life begins from there, from that place of humility. Praise be to God. That is, um, oh, we cut our, 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 our crowns and put down, uh, and then put on, uh, put off the, uh, not necessarily put, put off the royal garments, but have them on, but have a towel around us and go bend down and begin to wash the feet of other people. I think it, it, it is only reasonable that we think in those terms. And um, if it is difficult to do, if it is difficult to, to, to do, it only shows... It only shows where we, where, where we are. Because if Christ could come down, take the form of humans, and the Bible says that he, he lowered himself, he brought himself down, to, took the form of a servant upon himself to serve us, to go the way of the cross for us, down on, on the cross for us. Someone said, He could understand how Christ could come down and take the form of a, of a human. That he can that he can he can handle, but that God should die. That is really the hardcore. I mean, that that that's a hard bit. That is really lowering himself, lowering himself, all because he had taken on the form of man. That is for him to come down to take the form of a man was okay. But for him to die, subject himself to death, ah, that is to go very, very far. That is, he really lowered himself, submitted himself to, to, to die. Uh, that was great. I would say that a person's true position determines his possession. That is, your true position or your position determines your possession, the way you act. A person who stands in the place of Christ would act in a certain way, and it will clearly show that he stands in the place of Christ, or he stands in the, in the same place with Christ. A person who is not standing with Christ behaves in a certain way, and it's clear that he's not standing in the same place with Christ. And the Bible says that we are seated with him. Hallelujah. Um, those who are full of themselves cannot do otherwise, but have to behave so. Look at people like Joseph, David. Joseph was wrong. When he had the place of power, when he, when he came into place of power, the brothers ex- thought he was going to crush them. So when Jacob died, they came up with a, with a story. You know, our father, before he died, said, um, forgive us. Joseph was heartbroken. He said, Am I, do I stand in the place of God? I wouldn't do that. I'll care for you. I'll do you good. And indeed, he did. He didn't more treat them. David, when he came into place of power, he thought he'd have crushed all, you know, Saul's guys, but he didn't do that. Even when he had Saul in his hand, he said, I can't do this. I can't do this. And um, Jesus When he hung on the cross and people were ridiculing him, he said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So, a person's position really determines his actions. And... So, 
whether a, a person has really learned of the ways of the Father will show forth in his or his act, in his or her actions. It's clear. And um, humility is always towards God. When when we as Christians walk in humility, it is, it, it is always towards God. It's not people. What I mean is this. If my humility is just towards people, then it can be manipulative. I can manipulate you. Because if it is just towards you, then I am only trying to go so low so you would see and you would do certain things which I want you to do. But if it is towards God, then my, my, then my manipulations is already seen by God. And what, all that I'm doing is defeated. I mean, all that I'm doing is just null and void. It means nothing. So, but the truth is, our humility is not towards man. It's towards God. We are, it, is, it is obedience towards God. It is not trying to please man. It is to please him who sees where no one sees. Because some people are very, very smart. Some people are smart. They will go so low, so low, only to get what they want. And once they have it, they will show you their true colors. They will call you boss. They will call you sir. They will call you madam. They will call you magistrate. I mean, whatever, whatever, it, whatever it, it takes to make you know that they are really <laughs> humble. And so you begin to now open the treasures onto them. And once they have the treasures, then they will tell you who they really are. And that ain't humility. Because if it is, it will go the long way. Because humility is not lowliness. Humility is not being low. No, it's not. It is being high and being able to, though you are high, being able to put those things aside and do what what is very very um, low level if I should put it that way it's like um let me give a very good picture I have the picture in my head but I'm not I'm just running around like being in a place of power you have the power to crush when people are misbehaving but you would hold and you deal with them as if you don't have the power to do it. You could crush, but you wouldn't. Um, and um, another aspect of humility is that is it's is a way Christ was humble. Um, He humbled himself, took the form of a, of a servant, and served us. What prompted that was love. Love. So at, the, so, at the back of humility is love. What we call charity, Christian love. So, when humility is wanting, we shouldn't be looking at humility itself, we should be looking at <laughs> the love that is behind it. It means that love is lacking. It's like having a headache. I'm told that when you have a headache, it's not really the head that is at, that is at fault. It's something <laughs> in the body that's not going right. And so the headache is only 
a signal that something is wrong. Now, we could treat the headache, <laughs> give you painkillers, but the problem must still be there. So when humility is, is, is lacking, it is simply love that is lacking. Because at the back of humility is love. Because Christ was humble. He came down, lowered himself, did all that he could, I mean, did all that to serve us. Why? Because he loved us and he wanted to save us. So he'll go every extent to get us. And like we said earlier on, the humility is not to please man. It's God. Because if it is for man, it can be very, very, because I can do that. To manipulate people by going so low. But, then, but, but if I know it is not people who are going to measure it, but God then <laughs> I have to throw that element of manipulation out, away. That I'm not doing this because I want people to respond in a certain way. That it, it is basically what God wants from me. Praise be to God. So, humility, like, said, like we said earlier on, has nothing to do with lowliness. It is an act of will. Exercised by people of the highest nobility. Praise God. Okay, let's go to Philippians chapter 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 chapter, chapter two. Um, we will take it from the verse twelve, because I think we we had looked up to the verse eleven. We had run through the verse one to up to the verse eleven. Let's take it from the verse twelve. Now the verse twelve, um, and I'm and I'm glad we are we are starting from here because um, the verse twelve really <laughs> is an issue we need to deal with. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is an issue. This is an issue. Okay. Which means Paul knows them. He said, not all, not, 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 I know that in my presence you have always obeyed. But now in my absence, do the same. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And we say, this is the issue. Work out your own salvation. Sorry. Work out your own salvation. How is that? Um, but we thought salvation was by grace. And now he's saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some say, well, Christ started the work for us. But if we're going to go, go into glory, we have to work. We have to make sure that we keep ourselves saved. Um, I thought the Bible says it is he that keeps us from falling. <laughs> so here, what is he saying when he says, um, work out your own salvation? Um, so basically, and he, we know that this apostle Paul like, is the one that really has been championing this aspect of, of grace. And here he's saying we should work it out with fear and with trembling. I see if, if we don't do that, then we will lose it. But we know that we are saved. And Christ said, he, those that have come to me, I will in no wise cast out. So certainly, we should not understand this 
expression, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling uh, in, in the sense of eternal salvation. We should not understand it in that sense. Secondly, if we do, then it will also deny certain aspects of the scripture or it goes contrary to certain, certain aspects of the, of the scripture. In relation to election, justification, and calling, which, we ask, which, we, which all we know are ascribed to the free grace of God. We know it's by grace that all these things are working out. So it, go, it really goes contrary. And um, secondly, if we say that we, 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 we can work out our own salvation, then it means um, it really pokes holes or, uh, yeah, holes in the, in the perfection of God. That means in the wisdom, the, the, the wisdom of God in, in designing what he's designed for us really is not perfect because he has begun something and, and left for us to perfect it. And being, knowing man, who we are, we won't really, to, we won't really be able to, <laughs> to perfect it <laughs> as it ought to be. Then that means some of us, we're really in trouble. Because um, <laughs> I know I can't keep myself. Um, God have mercy. If God doesn't help me, <laughs> I, am, I am dead. Uh, because um, sometimes I think in Christendom, what, what some people forget is that we are still in this body. And um, certain things need to be done. Hello. Um, what else can we say? It, basically, God is going to allow some, some imperfections. Because some people want to add certain things to, you know, what they are doing. And would God be able to tell us, uh, well, you've not done it right? Because you left it to us to do it. And that was the best we could do. So really, um, there's a problem here. Secondly, there will be room for boasting, won't it? Room for boasting. Because at the end of the day, look at what I've done. Build my Christian life. Glorious. And then you have men having the road to chastise other people. You haven't built it the way you should do it. Then all those legalistic uh, claims will have a hold because we have the responsibility of working it out. And someone will say, but it is there in the scriptures. It is there. Work it out. Can't you read plain English? It is there. It's clear. But before we even argue on that. Let's just, let's just look at the verse 13. The, the verse 13 does not make that idea of we working it out really hold. Because it says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So how could he in just two in the same in, a, in, in the same moment, contradict himself. We also know that salvation is a, is a finished work of Christ. I mean, Christ, Christ has finished the work. It, it depends totally on him. He's done the work for us. Praise God. So we can be sure that this cannot possibly be the sense in which the apostle uses the expression, work out your own salvation. What we could say is that, this is what he's saying. That as you have obeyed me in my presence, now in my absence, live out your salvation. 
possibly, that's what he's saying. Live it out. You are saved. Like he says, um, walk worthy of the gospel. Live out the grace. The, the grace and everything that is needed. All the spiritual blessing, all, all that is needed has been given unto us. Now, live it out. Live it out in reverence to God. Live it out in fear and shame. In reverence to God, live it out. Oh, let me put it this way. Live out your salvation as a recognition of your respect for God. And then in verse 13, to live any, way, any other way is to make God a liar. Add in the verse 13. To live any other way than to live your salvation out is to make God a liar. Because God is at work in you. Making you will and to do his good pleasure. So to live any other way is to make God a liar. That he's not at work in you. So basically, what he's saying is that it is not the progressive work of salvation, like working out your own salvation, but rather living it out by the help of God within, by giving up the negative tendencies which always want to sh lift its head up. So by the help of the Holy Spirit relinquish those negative tendencies. Give them up. They will come into your mind and you want to follow them. Give them up. Because the Holy Spirit will, is helping you do it. So the so the working under salvation should be under, should be under, understood in the sense that live out your salvation, live it out, because it is God who is helping you by giving up those negative tendencies which we are prone to yield ourselves to. Like someone has wronged you. And you've purpose that you will never forgive. Says, live it out by letting it go. Live it out. Um, the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. You've seen your brother in error. And then you're on the mountaintops proclaiming it. So the whole world will know. Give up those tendencies. Why do you want to bring out the, the whole world to know the falls of your... What would you gain in that? If not only to exalt your own self-righteousness. Because the righteousness of Christ does not present itself, does not um, project itself by making other people feel down. That is self-righteousness that, that does that. Because the righteousness of God was given by God. So who are you trying to prove anything to? But self-righteousness is your own devising, is your own making. Is, is, it, is, it is a self-invented righteousness. So you want people to know that is the reason why you want everyone to know how bad this one is and how good I am. Because until you do that, people don't know who you really are. That is self, in, in the sense of, in the, in the, in the case of self-righteousness. But with righteousness that, that, that comes from Christ, God already knows. And you know God gave you. And you just walk in it. To God be the glory. 
So it is like um, it is like what the apostle is it's, it's like what Paul says in um, 2 Corinthians ten verse five, where he says, um, for the for, sorry four and five, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, casting the verse five is is, is, is my emphasis, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that it exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, I understand, oh, we know that in this context, he, he, was, he was talking about when, he's, when he teaches the, the, the word. When he preaches the word, what he's supposed to do. But we could apply this to our, ourselves. That... The word of God helps us or can help us cast down every imagination that arises here in our minds down. Cast them down and make them subject to Christ or bring it under the obedience of Christ Jesus. So basically, um, the the faith walk, the faith walk that we are trying to um, to describe here is this, or in uh, in a simple phrase, when he says, "Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling." Knowing that it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure, what he's saying is grow in love. Grow in love. Why do I say grow in love? Grow in love in the sense that we know that God loves us. Okay. We know that he loves us. And then, and as we, as we throw down the, the negative tendencies that rise up, that, would want, that the enemy would want us to follow, as we reject them and go the, work, the way of God, we know it pleases, it, it pleases him. So we show our love for him as we let these things fall down, as we go along, as we go along, as we go along. In the natural, what are we doing? We're growing in his love. We know, his, we know he loves us. And we are, we are returning that love or responding to his love by living in a, in a manner that pleases him. So in the nutshell, we could say, what he's trying to say is grow in love. Because love is not Just telling it, oh, I love you. Um, I, I, for, for, some, for some time now, I keep telling people, instead of me saying, oh, I love you, so give me this. I say, I love you, so I will do this for you. I keep saying to my wife, okay, I love you, so I will do what you mean to do f f for you. I said, what do you mean? I said, ah, you're expecting me to say, I love you, so do this and such and such and such and such. For me, and that's the way the world loves. They come to you and say, I love you, so give me this. No, love gives. So I say, I love you. What do you want me to do for you? And then she's, but she's stunned. She doesn't know, know what to say. That's okay. I love you. So what should I do for you? What can I do for you? Because love gives. So God, I love you. Okay, so I would, I would respond in the way that pleases you. So, grow in love or respond to, to God in the way that shows that you love him. Because he's working in you. He's the one at work in you. 
giving you the willing power and also the grace to do. So don't frustrate his efforts. Don't let what God is doing inside means nothing. Don't make him a liar. Let all men be lies and God alone be truthful. Hallelujah. So basically, have respect for God, for he's the one at work in you. Working, making your will, and also to do his good pleasure. To God be the glory. Now, to show a practical way of growing in God's love, to show a practical way of growing in God's love, he continues by saying in verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Other translation says, do all things without grumbling and questioning. Grumbling and or questioning. So basically, hey, in Exodus, the people complained and grumbled. And it didn't go well. When they were coming from Egypt through the wilderness. You know that those who grumbled and complained. Let's look at it. Exodus 16, 6 and 7. Exodus 16, 7 and 8. Sorry, 7, 7 and 8. It says, And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the, of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmuring against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to eat to the full, that the, for that the Lord heareth your murmuring, which ye murmur, which ye murmur against him. And what are, are we? Your murmuring are, are not against us, but against the Lord. And in Numbers 14, 27, he says, How long shall I bear with, thee, with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. So basically, murmuring, grumbling, questioning, and doing all those things, is not welcome in the work of the Lord. It's not welcome. Grumbling and memory and memory. Do this. And God wants us to do. You want to go this way? I don't believe we should go that way. It's not welcome in the work of the Lord. Why is the bishop saying we should go this way? And why is the bishop? It's not him. You, it's not the bishop you 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 be, you be remembering against. Or the leader of God's house that you be remembering against, but God Himself, He said. But for those who are growing in the love of God, they don't exhibit these things. Hallelujah. I will explain as we go down further. To grumble is to, to, to murmur is to grumble and grudge, to show one's unhappiness or critical attitude. Hmm. God have mercy. So basically, and to have disputes is to fight over issues. Have fight, or not fight over, over issues. So, so here in Philippians 2, 
in Philippians 2, what the apostle is saying is, do all things without. And that means avoid them. Avoid memory and disputes. Avoid. Avoid means avoid. Full stop. Avoid them. Don't encourage them. They shouldn't come near. Okay, all right. Okay, fine. I won't remember when I come to the assembly. That's my strategy. I won't remember when I come around the people of God. But when I go home, then I'll remember. No, it is still before the Lord. Because all, all we do is not to anybody. It is to God. So whether in the congregation, when you've come to the house of the, of the Lord, or you are in your home, memory and grumbling is memory. Memory and disputing is still memory and disputing. It should not be done. So where? In our hearts? Well, the Bible says if you go up to heaven, God is there. In the earth, he is here. And the earth is in our hearts. He's even much closer to yourself. So basically, it is not welcome in the work of God. It isn't. To God be the glory. He continues and is, uh, from verse 15, he says, that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain to God be the glory. Now, it will, um, Paul is saying that this should, this should live out their salvation, live it out in reverence to God. Or basically, grow in love. Grow in it by putting down all these things. All these memory and disputings and so you will be blameless before God. Holding forth the word of life. And then Paul says, as you do this, so that in the day of Christ, I will not have not run in vain. Now, let's understand. This is just a way, this is just a way of Paul expressing himself and challenging them to, to grow in love. Praise the Lord, or to live out their salvation. It does not mean that they are, they are, they are to live their Christian life to please Paul. <laughs> okay. Obviously, when people when when people get saved under your ministry or whatever, in the first few uh, in the first few moments or in the first few um, uh, days or weeks or whatever, they will be looking up to you. They might not immediately understand that it is God they're living up to. It, it, is, it is just natural. But this thing should not be something that should go on for very long. They should just get to understand that it is to God, it is God that they are pleasing. So any good teacher eventually will let them know, when I come to your home, don't be afraid to hide things because God sees them. I remember, I mean, I have been there. I mean, I've before, before, before been there. When you got born again initially and then brothers are coming to visit you and you're trying to clear your house, making sure that every, everything is fine because you don't want them to see any, 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 anything. But with, but with time, as you grow in the, in the Lord, you get to understand that no, it's not to them, it's to God. So before they came, God was already, already there. What was God seeing? So, I mean, <laughs> as long as we understand this as 
pro probably the early days of their faith, we, we, can, we, we can understand. But Paul obviously would not want them to live to please him. Hallelujah. But the point I want to really, um, I want to really point out here is this, that rewards, rewards in heaven will not only be for bringing people into the faith, but laboring and making sure that they live lives that glorify God. Because here he's talking about the fact that as they shine as stars in the crooked world, he will have honor. Glory be to God. So by helping them live, so as we bring people to the Lord, oh, hallelujah, I'll get a crown when I get into heaven. Yes, you get a crown, but there is also a crown for helping them live a life that is worthy of the gospel. So bringing them in, not just, don't just leave them, but also labor to see them live a life worthy of the gospel. Hallelujah. And this is all come back to the mind of Christ. Those who have the mind of Christ will labor, will do everything possible to make sure that those that they have led to Christ live a life worthy of the gospel. Because people who are not walking in the mind of Christ or, or living that out will not really care whether people are living worthy of, of the gospel or not. As long as the numbers are increasing, that's fine. Like what our what the um, what the what the educational system was trying to do some time ago. Um, I'm not too sure whether it's been scrapped. I heard that the EMA was to be was to be was to be was to be scrapped. Has it been scrapped? The EMA. It's still ongoing. Oh, come in September, it will, it will be scrapped. Because um, when I used to teach, what I'll get the students coming, sir, sir, please, 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 take my name. They will stay wherever they want to stay, and then when the class is about ending, they will just rush in and say, take me, so that they can get their money. So they were, not, they were not in the school for education. They were in there just to have their names tick so they can get their 35 pounds at the end of the week. And a, a corrupt teacher probably will have an agreement with maybe a, a student who wants to live that kind of lifestyle. Well, just come here and then and then just take you, and maybe maybe they get some favors from from the student. So would so would people in the church who do not have the mind of Christ, not really care about the about the life of the people in the assembly, but will just want to make sure that you are just coming, just keep coming, just keep coming. Whether the life you are living is worthy of, of, the, of the gospel or not, it doesn't really matter. As long as we keep coming in and putting in, in the offering, that's, that's fine. You add to the number, and then when we come on TV, it's a, it's a lot of people. And the money keeps coming. Like Eli. As long as the, the sons kept bringing in the meat, he was fine. So when the Lord revealed the evil in his own house and in the temple, Instead of him going before God and repenting, going on his, on his, on his, on his knee, crying, or like Phinehas did, whilst Moses was correcting evil, and one man goes to bring a, a woman into the tent, Phinehas takes a spear, go and sling them both together, and the anger of God was stayed. Instead of him doing something like that, he goes, it is the Lord, let him do what he Pleases.
that is a very sad comment to come from a priest. He revealed himself as a milk toast who could do nothing about what was going on. Couldn't correct what was going on. So basically, in the church, those who have the mind of Christ would labor and would put in, do, put in some effort, do whatever they can to help the people live a life that is worthy of the gospel. And that is the next thing that Paul says. That is, that is the next point he makes in the verse 17. Verse 17. He says, yes, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice. Hmm. I think this is heavy. Hello? He's saying, if my life be poured upon you to make your Christian life what it ought to be, I am joyfully ready. What a statement. In helping the church grow in their faith and service to the, to the Lord, the apostle is declaring that he is glad to pour out his strength, energies, everything needed to make their offering to God wholesome. I am ready to do anything, joyfully ready to do anything. Yes, and if I be offered upon a sacrifice and service of your faith, ready so be it this is contrary to popular opinion because i have heard the contrary over and over and over and over and it has almost and it almost seemed to be like the truth until i stumble on this text i said what is paul saying here doesn't it go contrary to the popular opinion I've heard many ministers say, you know what? I'm not going to kill myself. When I die and I go, they'll have another pastor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it over and over and over and over from many, many ministers. I'm not going to kill myself. If I die and I go, they'll get another pastor. Why should I kill myself? If what you are doing is to help them in their faith and in their service to God. Paul is saying, I am ready for my blood to be poured upon the sacrifice you are presenting to God. That means he's ready to give up his life for them to be strengthened in their faith, for their faith and their service to God to be wholesome. And today we hear people say, Oh, yeah. you know, I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to watch myself. Because if I die and I go away, that means what you are doing is not valuable. It's not precious. So do you pray for them at all? Are they God's people? God of mercy. Basically, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. When we turn our eyes off the gospel, all kinds of things show up. Let's see, let's see Let's see what Paul is saying. I mean, let's see Paul in Acts 20 verse 24. 
quickly. Let's see what he says quickly. As we... Acts 20 verse 24. He says, But none of these things moved me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with, with joy. Ha! He talks about, fin he doesn't count his life dear to himself. So that he might finish his course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord, Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace, sorry, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. When he was told that he would be born in chains, as he goes to you, he said, I count not my life dear unto me. And today, some are saying, hey, you, have to use you have to use wisdom. The work of God must go on. You must continue to, to preach. As if the work of God will be done in our own lifetime. Again, in Acts 21, verse 13. Acts 21, verse, thir verse, thir verse 13. Paul says, Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep? And to break my heart. For I am ready not to be bound only. But also to die at Jerusalem. For the name of the Lord Jesus. I guess maybe. What we are doing now. Is not for the name of the, of the Lord. There's a reason why. We could make statements like. Eh, if I die today. The church will employ a new pastor. So why should I die? then maybe what we are doing is not for the name of the Lord. Because Paul here is saying he is ready to die for the name of the Lord. If it is towards building, building the faith of the people, helping them grow and offer their sacrifice unto God Almighty, he is ready. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 15. He says, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 15, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you though the more i love you the less i be loved even though i'm loving you you're not loving me back but i'm ready to be spent for you this is nothing like the popular view that i hear these these days and in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. He says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to, to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. So if the people of God are dear unto us, and we are not ready to bear any challenges for them. It may be because we are on a different gospel. It may be because we are preaching a different gospel. Because the gospel of Christ. That's not say. <laughs> I'm not going to kill myself for these people. Paul is saying we are we're ready to give ourselves our own souls because you were dear unto us. Hallelujah. And first John three sixteen says that's that is John, this is not Apostle Paul, John, another apostle. Saying, First John three sixteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then when we go down to verse nineteen, let's quickly bring this one and summarize it. Philippians two verse nineteen. He makes mention of, he says, 
But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your, your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ's. But you know the proof of him, that's Timothy, that as a son with the father, he has served me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send to you presently. So, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also my, myself shall come shortly. Yet I suppose it is, it, is it is necessary to send to you a Paphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because you heard that he, was, he, he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be less, I may be the less sorrowful. Okay, verse 29. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. Not regarding his life to supply your lack of service towards me. So he mentions two people, Timothy. There's no one like an, Epaphro an Epaphroditus. For the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, trying to serve me. He was nigh unto death. He almost died. And supernatural power did not heal him. What I mean is, if supernatural power did not, did, did not prevent him from dying, he labored. And there's no one like Timothy, because all men seek their own. But, Simo, but Timothy seeks Christ and his kingdom. So him I will send. In the days of Paul, this was way, way back. And you, you, would have, you would have thought it would have improved. But today we have it. We have the same thing. Many seek their own comfort. Many seek their own ease and joy. And they will give every excuse. So they will not be able to do the work of God. Excuses upon excuses. Oh, I can't go here. Oh, oh, oh my. They, they'll give every excuse. But those who have the mind of Christ, those who have the mind of Christ, they are ready to lay down their comfort to advance the kingdom of Christ. Those are those with the mind of Christ. They humble themselves. Those with the mind of Christ will live out their salvation in the fear of God. Because God has loved them. And they show their love by growing in love. And they will labor. They will labor to supply what is needed to build other believers up. They will go through every, they will go through every challenge. I mean, they will go through it. They will survive. They will maintain an attitude of survival. They will not go about grumbling and them doing that. No. Even when it is biting them, they keep a steady mind without grumbling or disputing or questioning things because it is towards the cause of Christ. It is to advance the kingdom. They will do everything so that the kingdom of Christ will be advanced. And in Matthew 13, Christ said, as you did it to, my, to your brother, you did it for me. Because some people say, well, but it, 
but this is not Christ. This is a human being. This, this, this. Christ said, as you did it for me, as you did it for your brother, you did it for me. As you did not do it for your brother, you didn't do it for me. So sometimes it will look as if you are serving your brother who is in need. You are advancing the cause of Christ. So whatever effort, whatever thing you are doing to serve a brother or a sister who needs it, you are advancing the cause of Christ. Hallelujah. You are exhibiting the mind of Christ even when it goes against the grain. Even when in your tiredness, in your, you, are, you are still pre- pressing through. Not for the fear of man, but that the kingdom of Christ be advanced. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. This is our call. This is our challenge. That we will have the same mind that Christ had. Hallelujah. That the kingdom of God will advance. That we will have the mind of Christ. Someone will say, sorry, that we will walk in the mind of Christ. Someone will say, but how do we have the mind of Christ? How do we have it? In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, the Bible says we already have the mind of Christ. For who has known the mind of of the Lord? That he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We already have the mind of Christ. All we need to do is to live it. Hallelujah. You are not to pray for it. You are not to fast for it. We already have the mind of Christ, the Bible says. All we need to do is to live it out. Live it out. Understanding that negative tendencies will want to creep, want to creep in. So we will behave like the world. But we will grow in love. Hallelujah. Because God is at work in us. Causing us to will and to do his good pleasure. So we have the mind of Christ. Let's live it. In Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Shall we pray? pray. Father we thank you. That as we live this place. You continue to unfold, open our minds unto this truth that we are called to live the mind of Christ, live out the mind of Christ. Help us, Lord, by your spirit. Help us. We have the mind of Christ to live it out. And may we be a catalyst, challenging, mobilizing our believers to live out this, the, the mind of Christ. For a revival will break forth as we live this mind out. Help us, Lord. That your kingdom will advance. That your kingdom will advance. That your kingdom will advance. That many sons will come into the kingdom. That those who come in will see that indeed we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son and the Holy Spirit. That the works of the enemy will be put down and will not reign. That your name will be glorified in the earth. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.